Hey, what's up? It's Bobby Sapphire with the Hyperloops doing an X-Wing list tech video. I'm here with Hyperspace Extended Qualifier World Qualifier Champion Andrew Cox. What's up, Reflex? What's up, man? I think you got all the titles in there. You might have missed one. I'm not sure. <laughs> Breaker of Chains, Tractor of Boba Fett's. All those things sound correct. <laughs> Rocker. Roller of Evades. Roller of Evades. That's it. That's <laughs> Roller of Evades. Uh, that's all the titles. So um, really wanted to do this to shout out uh, both my boy Andrew, who won the Hyperspace Qualifier going 6-0 and on Saturday at PAX Unplugged, and then this beautiful list that uh, my brother came up with, my brother who top 16 uh, the, the system open, and it was something that um, he kicked my ass with all over our, my dining room for a couple months, and I took it to Reflex, and we really liked um, the expensive Boba Fett. And, you know, we started flying it a bunch. We both also liked the power of the Gunrunner and then thought that Justero was just like a really nice addition to um, bringing 101 point Boba Fett with two Gunrunners. There weren't a lot of options. There's very few options. If we wanted to run the Boba Fett, we did, um, which was like the main the main thing we wanted to do. Right. Yeah, for sure. I think once I started playing the list, I really saw the power of having uh, just this beefy Boba Fett in the endgame um, with the bid. He's 101 points when he's the last ship alive. So it was really a matter of getting the most use out of him um, and seeing what fit around him. Like one, Once I played it once, I, that was the build I wanted to go with, and I wanted to find out what was the most efficient to put around him. Yeah, one of the things that I feel like has not been talked about a lot in list building or on any of the podcasts or anything else that I've listened to or read is just like how huge it is to stack points in a ship, even though that like all ships are half points. You know, we used to hide, um, like think of Miranda Nim that we ran during regional season, right? It was like two 50 point ships that couldn't be halved. And it was like, oh, you know, you really can stack points in there. And then uh, when Kyla was around, you really needed to, to be able to deal with the fact that Kyla was going to be 47 points at the end of the game, unable to be halved. And you needed your ace to be 48 points or 47 points with the bid um, to even contend with that. And it's just like a tactic and a strategy that no one's really discussing, maybe because everyone's half points now, but that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily change um, the, the strategy in my mind, as long as you're understanding that like you also would need to get half on ships um, if you were halved. Yeah, I think pretty much in all the games I found, the end game states were always me up on points. I was always able to trade more points than um, what I was able to give them just because of the efficiency and how cheap our three naked ships are. So the quad jumpers at 28 and just there at 43. Um, if they died, I was usually able to take something out worth more than them. And then that just sets up our huge end game boba to have a favorable end game. So uh, the, the point breakdown just ended up working in our favor. And I always liked having the most expensive ship be my best ship and always have that alive at the end of the game, which is usually how it played out. Uh, boba didn't die over the entire weekend. Uh, he only got halved a couple times. Um, so it just it puts our opponents in uncomfortable situations when they're down on points and have to come get you instead of the other way around. Yeah, and um, another thing just about a Boba being 100 is that like the standard Boba of Marauder Han IG-88D is 91 points, which gives us a pretty big cushion. And I didn't look through all the lists, but I'd be surprised if there was another. Uh, my brother probably had the fattest Boba Fett in the whole tournament, um, which allowed him, you know, one of the reasons why he was able uh, to make the top 16. His Boba Fett was um, 106 points. Right, because um, he had this whole setup, but he also had shield upgrade. Um, so yeah, that was the only one that would really even contend with what we did. I, I flew against two ninety-one point Boba Fets uh, in the Swiss, and then nothing really even comes close to a hundred that I can that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, just looking at my sheet um, from uh, the games played, uh, I had a couple ninety-one, ninety-two point Bobas. Um... The only ship that was worth more was uh, Maddie's 106 Boba. Other than that, I have an Asajj at 91, and then everything else is in the 70s and 80s. So my ship was always the most expensive ship. Um, so even if we're trading half points, um, I'm still worth more. Um, and it just gave me a lot of advantages going into the end game. Yeah, even in my first round was um, a Boba double quad jumper paylob match. I felt pretty good, like being able to get that paylob off the board very quickly. Probably I felt quickly, more quickly than they would be able to get just arrow off the board, and then it's just like staying at parity. Um, so that that kind of match felt, you know, pretty strong. Yeah, with Boba being the most tanky ship we have and the hardest to bring down, um, and also the the least or the ship that our opponents wanted to shoot at the least just because of our Dengar trigger and all that other stuff we'll get into. 
Um, it generally meant that if we could trade, you know, just arrow, which is our second ship for their second ship, our, theirs were always worth more. Um, so, you know, we set this up knowing there was going to be a decent amount of payload, uh, Boba payload, double quad mirrors. I played two or three of them throughout the weekend. And almost every time I just, my goal is to trade just arrow for payload. And then we're up for the rest of the game as long as we trade even. Yeah. I played against a ton of payload too. So, um, so you bring up a good point. We should probably talk about how all these things work. So Captain Justero is probably, um, and you might you might know all these just by being uh, a tryhard or like Dion Morales did talk about this list on the Gold Squadron podcast this week. Um, but after an enemy ship suffers damage, if it is not defending it, you may perform a bonus attack against that ship. And we have a lot of different ways to, to proc it via the Jakku gun runners, putting ships on rocks. Um, the Dengar gunner, which um, is probably the card that people had to read over and over again for me. Is that, that how it worked for you? People just like really need to double and triple read it just to make sure they knew what was going on. I think like one or two people the whole weekend knew what it was without looking at it. Uh, most people I just explained it to and they understood it. Although a lot of people just, I just handed the card to and let them read it and see if they can figure it out. Yeah, same. Once I got like my third question about it, I was like, you should just read it because I don't want there to be any confusion. But it's um, it's it has like the um, some similar traits to like a hotshot gunner or like the Vader crew from Empire, which is but this is after you defend if the attacker is in your firing arc. Um, you know, so that procs both ways with Boba. You may spend the charge. It's a recurring one charge, so you can do it once per turn. If you do roll one attack die, unless the attacker chooses to remove a green token, which is any green token, um, you know, so like reinforce blows it out. Uh, on a hit or a crit result, the attacker suffers one damage. And, um, you know, in addition to that, we had Marauder for the back rerolls and being able to run Dengar IG-88D so we could get calculates, which um, gave us a buffer against Vader and can't be stolen by Paylob. And then Proximity Mines, which are just super underrated. Um, you drop the mine right on their head, they take a damage, and they roll two dice. And, um, yeah, it just has the ability to get crits in or, you know, take three total damage in the systems phase. And just... Um, you know, as you could see, if you watch the stream game for, between me and Andrew Knuckles, it's like, oh, Paylob's at one health, and he's right behind my Boba Fett. I, I can ignore him. I do not have to shoot him with my three ships. My three ships shot Fen that turn and, you know, got a damage into him, which, you know, against Fen Rao can be massive, just knowing that I had the free kill. And then Trick Shot to round it out, just like, you know, we, we are only really concerned about being at 199, so run the Trick Shot for value. Yeah, I think uh, the upgrade getting the most play after the the weekend is definitely Prox Mines. I think a lot of people came out of the woodwork saying, I've been saying this is good, I'm, it was underrated for a while, um, and it is. It's, it's only one more point than Proton Bombs. Uh, it's double the points of Seismic, um, and you get still get two charges, which is pretty insane. I think only at one charge it's worth six points. At two charges, it's just nuts. Uh, the guaranteed damage, um, whereas it's much easier to play around the bombs as opposed to the mines. Um, because they see them on the board in the systems phase and then have the entire activation phase to get around them. The mines, sometimes you just can't avoid them. Uh, but with it moving at five, is a lot of times moves after people. And with your boost, you can set it up to where they're going to get hit by it the next round. There's nothing they can do. Um, and then the ability to, you know, every once in a while proc a just there off of that and get a shot in the system phase is pretty nuts. Um, it's just a way to PS kill things, uh, clear up, wait, you know, more room for your gun runners to move to. Um, it was just so good, yeah. Uh, you know, 50% of the time you're going to do uh, two damage, which is, is pretty nuts. Yeah, I thought it was great. Um, I loved it from the beginning. Um, I know it did wonders for my brother as well. Um, you know, with his, like I said, the very, very similar Boba Fett to us. Um, yeah, anything else to say about the list? I think, like, double quads is pretty standard. People people know that two quads in a list is a thing. Um, you know, people kind of laughed at Justero, but... The Kerex got a pretty solid upgrade in that um, fifth hull point to be six total HP. It basically became a, became a scum X-Wing. Um, you sacrifice the three hards and the one straight to get one hards, which is pretty awesome. And then you get the two talon, um, which I'm a big fan of. I like the two talon like, way more than the three talon a lot of the time. Um, just mm -hmm. keeps you in the fight. Uh, and like with Justero, we're, we're not trying to do a ton with him. Just like keep guns on and, and have that pressure of them taking three to four dice, even if they're unmodded. Yeah, so, um, you know, the just their ability is good and all, but at most he's ever going to be having one mod. So it's not something that we're really planning the entire list around. It's just more of when it happens, it's nice, um, and it gives us some upside. Um, there's a couple games where just arrow just went nuts, rolled natties, and, like, killed two ships in one round. Um, but that's not something we're counting on. It's just like, oh, okay, that happened. That's some extra value we get out of it. Um, like, we ran all these things, Prox Mines, Dengar, 
not because we had Justero, but we kind of put Justero in because we already had those things and we had the opportunity to possibly get some extra value out of him. Yeah, exactly. He was, he was just ended up once we, you know, solidified that Boba and we knew we wanted two gun runners and we had, you know, 43 to 45 points. He just fit perfectly. He just did so well with all the things we already wanted to do. Um, and having Dengar Gunner is some, something that, you know, didn't get mentioned in anything I listened to beat the stream or the podcast is just... Gun, um, Dengar Gunner also just strips their green token, and when most ships are firing at, you know, I five um, or higher than three and one, it provides a lot of value. Um, even if it just takes the co- the token for Justero and, and the gun runners to get some damage in, um, which is which, you know, one of the things I like most about it. Even you know more than the the fifty fifty roll for damage, which you know always seems to not be a fifty fifty. It seems to be like yeah. a ten ninety. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I I mean, the Dengar is it's an interesting des- decision that I put your opponent in. Uh, most of the time, if I have shots, especially if I have shots coming in, I'd rather them lose the token. It's some nice um, counter to, again, two of the most popular ships we thought they were going to be, were Whisper and Paylob. They have a lot of tokens or will stack with Moldy Crow and then uh, Whisper with all of her abilities. So just being able to strip, put pressure on you know Whisper keeping that evade token or uh, Paylob stacking the focus tokens and then having multiple ships coming back and shooting afterwards. Um, most of the time, taking the 50-50 was the correct decision for the opponent. Um, stripping the, the focus token with three shots coming back at you um, is pretty nuts. Yeah, I played a Whisper in the second round, and it was against a local guy who um, like I drive with to tournaments, and he, he knew, and he was like, yeah, I'll take the 50-50, and he did it twice, and I just happened to hit both on his Whisper, but it's just good against Whisper when they don't want to get rid of that, that one of aid that they have. Um, you know, just to get that 50 50. And then late in the game, people are putting shots into your Boba Fett and you've got two arcs. There's a lot of, a, re- a lot of room to proc that ability. And, um, if they're going to shoot at you, the chances are that they're going to, that they're going to take a damage back. And for a ship like, um, Fen or Suntir, they really can't afford to lose, uh, damage that late in the game. Um, especially if Boba also has a shot on them, um, right after that. So it just provided a ton of value and is, you know, I think one my favorite scum gunner, if not my favorite gunner in the game right now. Yeah, I think it just played perfectly into our game plan of getting Boba into the end game, into a 1v1 or 1v2, um, into favorable situations. It changes the math and makes it really hard for our opponent to come back. Um, you know, if we're if we're up early on points, Dengar makes it really easy for us to trade evenly back. Yeah, sweet. Um, okay, anything else we want to say about the list? I was going to throw up the video because um, we just have the, the benefit of going through the rock placement and opening, which we could discuss because we have like... Mostly the same, but also some, you know, differing opinions. I know you thought I should have placed uh, Rocket 3, and I think my brother uh, had some comments uh, as well. So, one second. I clicked the wrong tag there. Hold on. Oh, shit. Uh, what window am I looking for? No, I think it's the... Oh, uh, they... It's the E. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, it was right there the whole time. Okay, so here's the video from the Gold Squadron podcast. And, like, so you see, um, I was doing. So, what we expect is that our opponent, when they see quad jumpers, will corner three rocks um, two on our sides and then one on uh, generally on their side where we don't go. I, I want my opponent to fly through their rocks. I specifically figured that um, a list like this with Gurry would want to be a little cagey at the beginning and not try and cruise through the rocks too fast especially since there was an open bottom but we'll get to that in a second and just want to make sure the sound is off here i don't want to oh i lost my mouse yeah so i put mine just about two and a half on the outside and you were saying that you had switched to three or thought maybe to do three and a half in this in this match yeah so um i went anywhere between two and a half to three and a half um, depending on the list I was facing and my strategy going in. Um, so we have kind of two different setups that we use throughout the weekend. One that's a little more stally and makes our opponents come into us, and then another one that breaks out faster and tries to attack them at their side. So depending on what th- I thought they were going to do it would depend on how deep I would put the, the rock. Um, so my opinion of this a list like this is they have you know two really fast ships that are both going to probably try to flank. Um, so I think I would probably want it deeper at three and a half, um, just because I would think he would try to get up the field a little faster, um, but I mean, you know, it's a it's a one range difference. It's not a, it's not a huge deal. It just kind of depends on where you want to set up, try to set up the engage. Yeah, and for me, what I really try to do is um, so put that at two and a half where that is, and you'll see me put one um, above that and um, a little bit closer to the middle. 
so that it sort of created like a little i tried to do like a little see i move it a little bit even more to the middle it's like a little mm -hmm. um like a little arrow like a little v if i was um you know on knuckle side so that he would have to um, he couldn't come through the middle without seeing the rocks or he would have to go the long way around um was the way i was thinking but then um, yeah yeah go ahead I uh, say, so yeah, this is something I actually changed up after our discussion on it is I used to try to make the rocks really tight in the center and try to make a, a cluster of a triangle. Um, after talk, talking with you, you thought it would be better to keep it wider just to keep rocks in play more often. Uh, generally, the barrel will, barrel will moves these ships a lot, so you don't have to have them so tight. Whereas if you have them wider, it's easier to have one rock in play no matter what angle they're coming from. And that was absolutely true and worked out great. Yeah, I mean, it's so beneficial to have, like, people working on the same list in different parts of the country, playing different people, and getting, like, a lot of feedback. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I'm going to speed up the thing here. Um, we'll see Knuckles put it in the other corner. And then this is uh, what I do is another thing that we talked about is that what we don't want is, like, three rocks and three rocks so that we're um, having this giant opening in the middle. Like, that's basically the worst possible mm -hmm. engagement. So I put the rock here, and I look, and I'm like, yeah, I can't put it there. I need to put it somewhere in the middle. Um and then what I found was that, um, yeah, so I kind of measured just to see. And then he, I figure he's going to rock that around there anyway, or he's going to do it um, on my side in the middle. Um, but he ends up cornering it. Um, and I, th one of the things I think about, like, putting this, this first rock that I did um, in the middle there at either 3.5 or even 2.5 is that it's a nudge for people to, um, like, know that I'm going in the middle and for them to corner which lets us put like another rock smack dab in the middle. Um, and that's part of the rough part about going first is that you can't play off of the other people, but he brought a 10 point bid. So um, you see what I'm doing here is like uh, making sure that my template doesn't go beyond range one, but I'm also making sure that I'm at 45 degrees so that when I, when I do a bank that it'll be um, straight and I'm not amazing at it, so I try and use my one template to just sort of make sure that happens. But we put these guys at a 45 degree angle facing each other so that they can bump. Yeah, so I actually use my one bank off the one range template to put it at a 45. Oh, okay. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it's good enough. Yeah, so this is the stall setup that we created. Um, there's a lot of different flexible openings you can you can make off of this uh, just based on you know testing on vassal and stuff um it, it lets you two bank or three bank with the quads out and have them nice side by side with a two turn followed by just arrow um you'll see that really nice formation and uh, break clean out of this leaves just arrow in the back um to be a little safer with the quad um you can also go to either side and and be able to break out to the side if someone's coming in and flanking uh, you want to stay in a little bit longer it just gives us a little bit of time uh, i think the most I ever stalled was three rounds, and that was only once. Uh, more than often or not, it was one or two rounds. Um, just to see where their initial placement was going while you're setting up positioning with Boba. Yeah, I don't even think I've ever had to bump for more than two rounds. Um, so here, I I still can do the Boba Fett tractor move, but with um, ships like Guri and Fen placing after me, the chances of me tractoring my own Boba are pretty low. <laughs> Um, just because they could go so fast and get into range that I, I really want to um, fake going fast and pull up in this match based on what he does with his opener um, or, or you know, dive in. And that's an, that ends up what happening. I don't know how much we're going to watch this, but um, I end up doing a three and then uh, just doing a one the second turn. And then I go in much, much faster once I see that he's not... He's not moving fast. And, and another reason why, uh, normally we might keep this formation closer together, but I had just this wide open range that I really wanted to be in this open area between these two rocks on my side. So that way I could really go whichever way I had to based on where his fast ships were going to be. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I thought you absolutely won this uh, rock game. I think uh, it's set up into a it, what looked like a nice open area for him to engage in, which he ended up doing. Um but still was like refined enough that it forced him to go into the angles that you wanted to. And you'll see that um, by what he, he does with Guri. Um, she's not really, she doesn't really have anywhere to go behind Boba into the, what eventually was a prox mine. Um, so I thought this was really nice and what looked appetizing for him to come into. Um, but it, in the end, it wasn't there. The rocks are still going to be in play no matter what. Yeah, and by you setting up Boba and your guys on this side, it also forced him to go to the top side of the map, which is better for you because those rocks are closer together. Um, so that was really good. 
by you placing first, you can kind of dictate where he's going to because he doesn't want to just straight joust you. Right. Um, yeah, and we can kind of just like jump to where that. So you see, like I do the bump and then I do the the three straight, and I decide not to boost. Um, I because I decide I'm gonna pull up because I there's no real way for his Gurry to engage me behind that rock. Um, you know he he can't barrel roll to either side and and really get shots off. So I figured that he wasn't coming in this round at all. Um, and we'll see that th that was the case uh, when we place here and his Gurry ends up you know way over to this side. Um, and at this point, um, I decide I'm gonna go in fast. And do a three bank, and I think about um, this boost with Boba. I think I fast forward it right to the right spot. Is like you can see the template in my hand. I'm really contemplating the boost, and I go for it because I realize that he's going to come in fast this way. Um, he can't really turn this way and come in here. He only has this barrel roll that he does, which is um, to his right and back. And when he comes in, if he does, if he does a three, he might catch me, but I think not. He has to do a two, which just doesn't feel like a Gurry move. Like, she wants to get right in there. So, um, you know, he was really fast. And, yeah, I don't have the shot on him, but he doesn't have the shot on anybody, which is way more important. And I think that's probably – actually, we have we have the diagram to show that he doesn't have the shot on anyone right here. So we drew those those 80-degree lines there. Um, that's really all I have to say about the, yeah, again, break down the video. It's not like, you know, I don't want to break down the whole okay. game. I just like, we could, if that's what you, if you think it'd be interesting, um, or to, or to go no. over any other points, but after, you know, after the engage happens and the quad jumpers start rolling a lot of evades, it's, um, the longer they stay alive, the more beneficial they become. Like I end up putting them up on a bunch of rocks because of it. Yeah, no, I think this was a really good job of demonstrating what our rock strategy was and what our general open was. I think this engage is almost ideal um the quads aren't going to die like no sh none of our ships are going to die and they're in a position to uh, affect the second round which is what you want them to do you want to try to engage at range three or range four so the quads can then get in on, on uh, round number two to you know mess up the combat and throw people on rocks lose their actions uh, so that we can punish so this this opening engage it looks almost perfect i don't know if i could draw it up any better yeah, so the only other thing that's like a little interesting is like, so I have the opportunity to drop this uh, prox mine behind Boba Fett in the system space here. And um, I know that he can avoid it. Obviously, it's Gurry. If I don't drop a bomb right on her head, but he already didn't engage with Gurry that round. And I figured he either had to go over it or he had to go way around it and not shoot. Um, you know, because if he does a three bank, he really has to like come here. That three bank doesn't clear. So he has to like go this way and then end up way out here. Um, because I, I mean, I just figured he did a, a bank here. Um, I thought he would go after, so he does opt to fly on to the bomb, which, man, my fast forward skills are not elite. Um, oh no, blown out by Dion's ad. Um, well, we'll watch Soda Stream ad. Um, he does get right, he does go over the bomb and he gets right into range one of all three of my ships and he can choose, basically gets to choose to delete mm. whichever one he wants and he chooses just Stero over one of the co the quad jumpers. Um, what do you think about that move? Yeah, so again, uh, coming into the tournament, we had talked and discussed, if we could choose any anyone for any of our opponents to shoot, it would be just arrow. So he's kind of the bait in the list in that he looks really scary, but again, two shots with one mod. Doesn't have that much uh, consistency in doing damage. So um, he's kind of just there to pull aggro from the quads that absolutely should be the first um like we said we're trying to trade just for you know one of his pieces that is worth more in this case paylob we trade just for paylob and we're way ahead and our quads are able to really limit the places that the aces can go boba's biggest weakness are aces that move after him things that are more maneuverable and can try to get into his side arcs um so we have the quads there to protect against that if you have an ace list and you're not taking the thing that counters you away from us then it just makes Boba's job way easier. Yeah, and um, I end up getting the block here on Fan, which which should be pretty huge. But he, um, uh, I blank out with Justero. I had to take the target lock, so Paylob couldn't steal my focus. Um, so I take t two damage there, and then Gurry just finishes him off. Um, he, uh, she'll finish him off in a second, so he doesn't even really get to to help at all. But it leaves the quads at full health going to the third engagement, and I have um, I have a tractor here uh, on Fen, and then um, it, I 
stupidly took a stress here because I overthought myself, but like it, and in a second, I'm going to be able to like it, the following one, I'm going to be able to move backwards. Ideally, I'd be able to move backwards on that turn. Um, and then I set up the, the, the system phase kill on, or it doesn't go off in the system, but when Paylob moves, he dies. Um, cause he's at one hull and takes the bomb here. So just by killing Justero, I felt is what really allowed me to win this game. It's just, he, he took those shots in Justero and, um, yeah, it just allowed my quads to do so much work in the late game and just set up all my boba moves. Yeah, if he kills a quad there instead of just arrow, I think it's a completely different game. Yeah, um, I think it's way, way harder. In almost every single one of my games, everyone went after just arrow first, including you know my finals game. Um, and that's just it's that's perfect for us. If if you leave our quads and boba until the end game, um, there's very few things that are going to be have an advantage over that. Yeah, quads are so hard to deal with when um, when one of your ships is down or they're in open space and the formations are broken up. Their ability to go backwards to and sloop and just like they're just so insane. Like I I had a, a quad jumper solo a red line basically because he just jammed him up, blocked him forever, and then finally the guy got frustrated and guessed wrong, and my and my quad jumper got behind him and he never stayed. He was always behind him just for the rest of the game. It was crazy. They're just really hard to deal with one on one. Yeah, and the the big thing is that the difference between one quad jumper and two quad jumpers is is huge. So one quad jumper is fairly easy to navigate if you're an ace. Um, two quad jumpers takes up so much more space, especially if you're somebody like Whisper. I can cover both of your D like generally you realistically only have two viable D cloak options. Gen there's a, it's very rare where all three are, are real. So if I have two quad jumpers, I can cover both D cloak options. If I only have one. It's very easy for you to to pick the correct one. Um, so, really taking one off one of the quads off early um, takes away a lot of the flexibility that the list has. Yeah. Um, well, that's all I got, buddy. Anything you want to add? I just want to congratulate you again for qualifying for Worlds with this this masterpiece of a list here. Thanks, man. Yeah, it was a it was a pretty good weekend. I, I felt really good about the, uh, after after Saturday, not so much on Friday. Um, but we went a combined. 14 and four with the list over the weekend. Um, all of our losses were, at least my losses were super, super close. Um, yeah, so, both my losses were playing for top 16. So both, both people that beat me made the cut. Um, one of the guys that I beat made the cut and I had to play him again the next day and I beat him again. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I felt really good about the list. It just, um, it, you know, it's a lot of work. It was really grindy. Um, I didn't feel like any of my games we're super duper easy, um, only because the quad jumpers and flying them well make it tough. And then also, like you're obviously always trying to um, remember all. There's a lot of triggers in the list, and um, making sure Justero is flown well so he can actually take advantage of that ability. It just um, it leads to a lot of decisions and a lot of um, you know decision fatigue and just in um, attention to detail. I guess I would say. Yeah, it for sure was. Um, it was not easy to play uh, 12 games of this over two days, but I think the meta was pretty much what we expected to see, and the list performed how we thought it would. Um, having the bigger boba was always a huge advantage. Uh, our tech choices really worked well against the ships we thought we would see the most, like Whisper or Redline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just yeah, it, it was good to see you know our our testing and our practice effort put in pay off how we thought it would. And uh, I was obviously really happy with the performance. Sweet. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, do it again after Adepticon. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Uh, Hyperloops out.